Welcome back to another episode of Fresh Out of College, your weekly dose of sports and pop culture. My name is Drew Campbell, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Rihanna Chino. Today, we have another special guest, Tess Bodie, who goes to Duke University. She was recently drafted by Sky Blue FC in the NWSL draft, just like Kaylee last week. And we got to know her off the field really well. Drew had some great quick hitters for her. Uh, we got to learn about her soccer career and what draft day was like for her and also talked about Grey's Anatomy with a lot of spoilers, so make sure you're caught up. Yes, spoilers is key. Um, let's hop into it. Today we are joined by Tess Bodie, who plays soccer at Duke University and was recently drafted by Sky Blue FC in the NWSL draft. So we are super excited to have, uh, have you here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, super excited to hop on with you guys um, and excited for where this goes. Perfect. Tess, Drew, you want to start it off? Yeah. Tess, how, how is the um, preparing for the season with this whole COVID going on? How, how's the preparations for this upcoming season? Yeah, so it's been super weird, actually, because ACC had half of our fall season, while mm-hmm. most conferences obviously didn't get to play. So this is the longest season I've ever had. <laughs> um, I think we had like 12-ish games in the fall, and then we have five throughout the spring, and then tournament in May. So it's been stretched out, which I've enjoyed, but it's also been just different. Yeah. That is crazy. You've had, because I know like other sports, they just didn't have a season altogether and this would be their start of the season, but you just continued, mm-hmm. continued the season. Um, well, good news is this will be your longest one. So after this next season, you'll be, you know, prepared to do everything um, with your stamina and stuff like that. So I have, I've prepared 10 questions for you. Um, the quick hitter time. So I'm going to rattle them off. And then just give me your answer and we can go back and forth with it. Um, but the, the only thing here, the only requirement is they have to be right. Okay. So here we Got go. It. Very important. <laughs> um, okay. First one. If you had to eat one food for the rest of your life, what would you choose? Mm, probably some type of pasta. I eat a lot of pasta. There we go. Rita, what would you do? Um, you know, it was actually, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, come on on your feet. I think, a, I think tacos, tacos. <laughs> tacos is a good one, actually. Cause you can add a lot of variety. Nobody right. wants it's pizza. a general, it's a broad answer. That's no, so broad. No pizza. Tess, what kind of pasta would you do? Is it, is it kind of like what I do with just noodles and butter or is it something more? Um, if we're going with every day, I'd probably yeah. want to keep it simple. So yeah, maybe right. some penne with marinara sauce. Nice. All right. Well, that's mm-hmm. getting me hungry. Okay. <laughs> Second question. We're still on food because I, I, does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes. Okay. No, definitely. Interesting. I would not choose that because I believe pineapple is best on its own. Um, and you don't want to mess up those two great foods. That's why I asked. Rio, what do you think? Uh, on, pineapple definitely belongs on pizza. That's what I think. I'm, I right. think very strongly about it too. Okay. Well, I do not want to get into a heated argument with you. So I'll go into the number three. Um, Tess, if you could visit one place, what would that one place be? Ooh, probably Patagonia. Nice. I think I would choose, I think I, because I told you before, I wanted to go to Tahiti and I wasn't able to. So I think I would have chosen that Tahiti place. Um, but Patagonia, nice. Why, where, why, where why is that? Patagonia? It's kind of like on the border of Chile and Argentina in South oh, America. Okay. Um, and why? I mean, I don't know. Growing up in Colorado, I've just always appreciated mountains. And I think it's just from what I've heard and seen, one of the most majest- majestic mountain ranges. So. Yeah. I think I would also choose because I, I made these questions, so I have to, you know, display an answer. I think Madagascar would be fun too. Don't you guys think? Have you guys seen that movie? Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. The movie okay. gave it a great rap. Perfect, right? I yeah. think I, because if I go to Madagascar, I believe I would see talking animals um, everywhere and it would just be it amazing. <laughs> okay. It happen. Would you rather be a character in The Office or on Parks and Rec? 
I do love both of those shows, but I think I'm going to have to go with The Office. Okay. Just because Michael's there? Michael and also Jim and like Dwight, that whole dynamic is just, I think I'd get a kick out of it. Yeah, that's true. Rioda, what would you want to be on? You know, as much as I want to be in the office, like test it, I, I don't think I could work in there. You know, is you still have to it's, make it's, a living. So I think Parks and Rec's just a little bit more ideal for, for work. <laughs> I mean, it is interesting. It is a paper business. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the longevity in it is, is wild. But a character like Michael, that's just the boss to have, I guess, um, to have yeah. pointless meetings. World, world's greatest boss. <laughs> he does have, yeah, he has a mug and it's all. Um, <laughs> Tess, what do you think the most overrated TV show right now is? Overrated? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's I don't have one off the top of my head, honestly. All right, Riotta, give me yours and then Tess. Wait, I the, do. Game of okay. Thrones. Game of Ga- Thrones. Took me a while to think of it, but there it is. Yes, Game of Thrones. I would have to... Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I can... If there? we're... If we're going to stay on this line for 20 minutes, I can explain to you why Game of Thrones is the perfect series for anybody. Um, <clears throat> but I won't because I don't have 20 minutes. Riotta, what do you think is the most overrated TV show? Tess says Game of Thrones. Do you agree? Um, I mean, I can't think of one, so I'll, I'll just go off of it. I mean, it's funny. Drew and I, well, Drew, uh, good friend of Drew and I what, were really into Game of Thrones when it came out, and they tried to get us to watch it. I was one of the people who kind of refused to watch it because it did get kind of boring for me. So I, it's, I mean, but why? Kind what, of along what is, the same lines, I guess. Is it because it's just too good? Is that why it's overrated? <laughs> it was just really slow for me. I don't know. Oh my gosh! All right, it, yeah. it's borderline um, for yeah. me. Okay, it's well, you guys are breaking my heart. I don't do dragons. <laughs> what dragons are the best? Okay, well, <laughs> what movie has made you cry? I cry in pretty much every single movie, even like comedy. Oh, really? I just cry. Yeah. Wedding Crashers. Wedding Crashers is hilarious. I don't know why. It's hilarious. I cried. So all of the above. That's fair. I think, yeah, I think I cried in, um, I cried in The Notebook. I cried in A Star is Born and I cried due to laughter because of Wedding Crashers. But I don't think I cried Still because cried, I, I did. I guess that is true. I guess I have to make it more specific in my next question. Um, Rita, what is your most, what, what movie have you cried in? Um, you know, since I know these questions already ahead of time, I put some thought into this one. I'm going to go with an underrated movie that a lot of people don't know about. And I've told Drew and Justin and all my other friends to watch it. They never watched it. Age of Adeline. Really Age good movie. Age of Adeline really good is it the one that's the one where she's like don't give it age. away it has blake live lively 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 blake lively, blake lively. Yeah, and harrison ford actually so oh all-star cast well well i'll give it a watch Definitely you should do. okay that's good i'll i'll, I'll you should have a tissue make sure to have a box of tissues next to you though if you watch sure. okay, that's noted. a big okay well for tess everything's gonna happen uh, that doesn't true. okay fine <laughs> tess what what's your dream concert lineup? We're moving into music now. Oh. Okay. Give me give me your, give me the headline and then somebody that's going to be supporting it for the concert. Mm, okay. Um, this is really tough for me because I have a wide variety of music I like. So I don't know if I can necessarily pair a country artist with some pop person. That's true. But I'm going to do it. Um, headliner Justin Bieber. Okay. Big Justin Bieber fan. But opening, I would have Kane Brown or Luke Combs, one of the two. I love Luke Combs. Good choices. I was gonna say, um, I was gonna say opening is Eric Church, and then the headline is the Lumineers. Boom. It just gets you it the everything happens. That's a vibe. I know. So right? I've actually been to the Lumineers before. Really? Where? Um, at Red Rocks. Okay. And I don't know if you've made it up there yet because I know you live in Colorado, but you need to because it is so beautiful and just, I don't know, an experience. So the Lumineers there and it was raining and it was magical. 
That's perfect. That's what I want. Okay. I, that's my, that's my dream concert. I also like your lineup there. Um, and Rieta, what do you, what do you say about that? Who's your dream lineup? I mean, since we're talking lineup, you guys only chose two. I'm kind of confused on what, what you guys think a lineup is. For me, that means nine, nine people in the lineup for, for <laughs> All baseball. Right, Rieta, so, no, let's put Rieta on the uh, spot. Who so are a couple, nine? Uh, a couple of big ones. I think um, Taylor Swift's new album is really good. So Taylor Swift has to be on there. Oh, yeah. John Legend. Wonderful. Uh, Coldplay. Um, the Weeknd. We'll throw mm-hmm. Drake in there. No, that's, I think that's enough for now. Oh, Billie Eilish. I can't forget about her. That's okay. a good lineup. I would, I'd buy a day pass. Yeah, I f- yeah, that's true. I guess, okay, this is what I was thinking. That. When I said lineup, I was thinking, you know, three hours, you're done. You're done. But Rita, you just, you explained to me a festival. So that's mm-hmm. what a lineup is though. Well, I'll create lineups for the Super Bowl co- uh, halftime show. It's just a right. concert. Um, Tess, what was your favorite, uh, or sorry, do you have any pregame rituals before a big game or any game in general? Um... Yeah, it's like kind of embarrassing maybe, but I watch a series of videos that include like Nike and Beats commercials before every single game. That's good. That's not embarrassing. Kind of lame and weird, but yeah. That's not embarrassing. That I, yeah. Do you, okay. I actually, do you own Beats? Uh, I do, but I don't really use them. I gave them slash sold them to my brother. Well, the ads sort of work then, I guess. Yeah, I that use AirPods. Way. <laughs> that's true. AirPods yeah. have kind of surpassed them. But, um, well, that's okay. You know, I would I would have a pregame ritual when I did um, high school basketball and also uh, intermeals, uh, championship two years running. Intermeals. But all I know is that the pregame rituals that I did never really got me anywhere. So I feel like, I mean, I would always end up either ending up on the bench or scoring a total of five points and six turnovers. So I just feel like the pregame rituals have been just, they haven't hit me yet. Maybe I'm not doing it wrong, but I guess I have to try the Beats commercial and, and something. And I, see if yeah, that works. you know, I think, I think you're doing it wrong, <laughs> what I'd say. Because if I just watch the videos, I'm, I'm amped, I'm ready to go. That's fair. That's fair. I, you get, have to send me the link because then I'll, I'll definitely zero I'll in. I'll pass them along. Got to share me the, share the secrets. Okay. <laughs> what has been your, your favorite player growing up? Like who have you idolized? Um, and yeah. Um, I'd say the last like four years or so in college is De Bruyne um, from Man City. I think he is an excellent player and super fun to watch. Um, but kind of more so growing up, I'd probably say Messi as basic as that is. No, that's good. I mean, Messi is, I, even when, if, even though I didn't even play soccer, I still know Messi. And, and I feel like if I know Messi, I also know uh, Ronaldo. And I feel like those two have just been at the center of soccer for so long. It's kind of amazing, really. Um, that's really cool though. Okay. What was your most memorable, or I guess what, I guess you could still have a memorable <clears throat> moment at Duke, but just thinking from what you played, what was your most memorable moment um, during a game? at Duke for you? Um, probably my freshman year, um, scoring my first goal. It was in the tournament um, and it was on our home field. And it was, I nagged the girl. So I just, you know, felt nice. pretty good about myself. Did you um, have any celebration with that? <laughs> so I actually, I was like very off balance for the shot. So right as I shot it, I was, fell on the ground. And so I kind of just did like one of these, like, like on the ground, like, thank God. And I was exhausted. So I basically laid there as my teammates like came and picked me up. Oh my gosh. I guess. Yeah. It just happens. And there you go. Well, you, you did my 10 questions or my 11 questions. I don't know how many that was, Um, but you, you did quick hitters and see, it wasn't that painful. I made it. Um, I survived. Yeah. And we, we got to know you off the field. Um, All right, Rita, you want to take it over with, Tess's journey um, to Duke and also getting drafted. Yeah. So now this is our segment where it's all about you, you know, mostly focused on that, that soccer journey. And obviously congratulations to you to, for getting drafted. Um, it's a huge accomplishment. And obviously there's still a lot more we're going to talk about later, but talk us through 
I don't know, just your soccer career up to this point, you know, like when was the first time you touched a soccer ball? When was the first goal uh, you scored? What was high school like? What were those U.S. camps like? Just take us through that that path. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I started playing soccer when I was two, three, I believe. Um, Very young. I have an older brother who he's three years older than me. So from the moment I was, able to walk I was out at his soccer practices because my mom was his coach just kind of kicking the ball around having all these you know older boys tormenting me as I ran away with their ball um and my brother always likes to say that he's the reason I'm like skilled on the dribble because he used to chase me all around the house um so we'll give him the credit there got Uh, you yeah but yeah so I've been playing basically since as long as I can remember um and I think the moment that soccer kind of became my life um, and like I knew that was what I was going to do in life was probably around fifth grade. Actually, no, it was fourth grade um, because I was on this 3v3 team uh, and I don't even know how this came to fruition, but we ended up winning um, the world championship and we were like, I don't even know, 11 at the time. Um, And it was in Orlando, Florida and we just were having so much fun and ended up being really good and just kept winning. So I still have a, a world championship trophy and it's like two feet tall wow. and it's just in my basement in my house. <laughs> it's awesome. so that was the moment that I knew. I was like, this is what I'm going to do because this is fun. Plus you're world champion. You're, I mean, you, you can't even get any bigger yeah, than that. Circa like, Oh nine. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I peaked, honestly. Oh, <laughs> well, and then that's what, about, what you say, yeah. but you know, then we, we read up on you a little bit, like you went to some, you know, U S national camps. It sounds like you're actually in South Korea. Is that kind of where that traveling hobby also began? A little bit, actually. Yeah. I'd say soccer. Um, you know, I was saying earlier to Drew before our call that I've been to a lot of cool places for soccer, but I don't really get to do much there. So I think soccer has kind of wet my appetite where I've gotten to like sit in in South Korea and different places um, and like see that culture, but then really want to go back and immerse myself in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that uh, South Korea experience was definitely pretty interesting. It was like a 20 hour plane ride or something. And I had never left the country before that. Oh, wow. Talk about <laughs> yeah. the movies you can watch. Wow. So, right. <laughs> so when you're at South Korea or when you're in that environment, do you, is it just practice, practice, practice or games, 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 or are you able to go out and kind of explore the city? Um, yeah. So for basically any time that it was with the U S like youth national teams, it's very like lockdown. Interesting. Two okay. trainings a day, morning, afternoon, every meal is kind of like structured for you. There's meetings in between um I think they took us out once into the city for like a half day we like went to a market um and ate at a restaurant kind of in the area we weren't in Seoul though we were in a pretty small town and I don't I don't even know where actually okay. but yeah and then it's the is it the whole team or is it the whole team or are you playing against is it just training or are you actually being able to play against those teams or I don't know um yeah so we played the South Korea like 20 or something team um but we had I think we brought 22 girls so we had enough to do inner squad anyway um so we kind of did a little bit of both wow that's really cool oh my gosh Mm -hmm. so Drew and I have never been sorry (laughs) Drew and I have never been invited to a U.S. you know basketball camp or baseball camp so what are those like and did you know as far as the recruiting process did those help jumpstart you know colleges reaching out to you or was that before and then the camps happening um yeah great questions the U.S. national team definitely helped a lot in college recruiting um just because especially living in Colorado it's so hard for coaches to get out and see me play um and when they know you've been to a camp they're kind of like okay she's at least somewhat legit um So those kind of coincided together, I'd say, with getting college notice and then also getting into camp. It was around the same time, like eighth grade freshman year, 
um, when I was doing that, you know, at the most. Mm -hmm. um, but the camps are, it's like pretty funny because it's these young kids like when I look back and think about it, it's funny in the moment I was so like in it, you know, like this is so intense, but it's just funny looking back because everyone's so young. It starts at U15 maybe. So 14 year olds, even younger um, going into these camps and like you go away from your parents and they ship you all these clothes before you leave that you have to travel in. It's really exciting because you get like new shoes and new Nike gear and you get this like polo. Um, and so it's cool walking through the airport because you have like a US soccer polo on and you right. are like 16 years old and you're like, whoa, like I'm so cool. Um, but the camps are really fun. You end up making a lot of great friends from all around the country, which is a really fun part. I think I mentioned last time we spoke how soccer has this like bubble. Like you just know everyone who's anyone in soccer. Mm -hmm. And I think these camps, kind of cultivate that mm -hmm. yeah, it. yeah it is different than like I feel like how I mean you're right soccer they get you at such a young age and then I mean for even like football or and like football there's just so many so many massive teams and it's kind of you know I have a friend that talked about like how he was like yeah I don't really know that many people um, if it unless it's you're talking about like the district or like the team but you're saying that it's just so widespread and and that, I think that's the cool thing about soccer and how it, you know you grow relationships when you guys all want the same thing but the U.S. the, the camps help you kind of cultivate that and um, keep lasting relationships even into college too um, which is really cool but yeah that's that's awesome and then like you said you get to go to other places in the world and and get get a taste for that too. So it's great, you know, hearing, you know, that story all the way from, you know, first time touch soccer ball being chased around your brother um, to being in South Korea, but now um, draft day, you know, that was really recent. And I read that you weren't aware at all. So I kind of want to hear about that process. You know, was there a lot of screaming, uh, frantic calling your parents? Like what, what was, what was that like? <laughs> Yeah, so um, kind of weird this year with COVID, they changed the rules of the draft to where anyone who'd exhausted three years of eligibility um, was automatically allowed to be drafted, whether they entered or not. I don't really know how it works for other sports, but for soccer, you usually have to enter. Um, and so anyway, I decided not to enter. And one of the, or the reason I didn't enter is because I'm, wanting to stay for a fifth year at Duke. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to stay for a fifth year is so I could be a higher draft pick and kind of help my, you know, draft selection, um, which is kind of ironic now, I guess. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I was not expecting it. I'd been talking to a coach, but I uh, had a conversation earlier in the morning with her on draft day and just kind of said, you know, a fifth year is what's the priority for me right now. Obviously, professional soccer has always been my dream, um, but I think I want to hold that off a year, get some more training under my belt, uh, you know, get another year of education at Duke because, you know, how can I pass up a grad degree from Duke? Um, and we kind of left it at that. And so I was just not expecting it. And we've been watching the draft. My roommate and I turned it off about halfway because it was just, it was long. It was like a four hour draft. And so it was around 1145 at night or something. And I was oh, wow. falling asleep, watching a little bit of Grey's Anatomy. Um, and my roommate came running in and she was like, Tess, like you just got drafted. And I like sat up and she turned the lights on. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, and she's like, yeah, I think like Louisville drafted you. And I was like, Louisville, like I didn't talk to them. Like, I, and anyway, it turns out it was sky blue. Um, and I pretty quickly got a phone call from the coach. Um, and I like, thank God my roommate had come in because I would have answered the phone totally like caught off guard, knowing no idea, having no idea what she was talking about. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the story of how the events unfolded. Um, but it was so exciting. It went zero to a hundred, just a normal, like, what was it? A Wednesday, a normal Wednesday night. And all of a sudden, my phone was just blowing up 
And like my family, I, I about 20 minutes later realized I hadn't told them yet. So I texted my family group chat and they all thought I was like messing with them. So <laughs> I think that's hilarious. I think I got three things from that. I think the one thing is you, uh, you said that the draft was long, four hours long, which I mean, I can, I can relate to watching the MLB draft when there's like 67 rounds. I'm like, oh my gosh, when are the Mariners coming up? But that's, that's pretty great. Um, second thing is having your roommate come in and tell you, and then I can just see you like, wait, hold up. I need to finish this episode of Grey's. It's getting good. <laughs> just say, and then, um, but then have it also, was a big episode. it was, I, and we're going to get into that, but um, and then texting your uh, your parents and your parents are like, uh, this is t- Tess again and is just is yanking our, yep. yanking our tail again. <laughs> but that's so funny. And and something like, I feel like that that will live with you. And it's just, that's awesome. Um, culmination of a lot of stuff there. I mean, congrats to you. I mean, getting drafted is big time. Um, but I just, that, that story is so funny. And um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how does that, you know, with the rule change that it, you're allowed to go, you know, um, go to school for another year at Duke. So does that mean like you sign a contract? So they have sky blue has your rights when you like go pro, like what, what is that? Or is it a verbal commitment? Like how, how does that work? Yeah. So good question. Cause it's all kind of new, obviously with COVID all these people have extra years of eligibility. Um, so basically they have my player rights. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whenever I go, which is still kind of TBD, um, Mm -hmm. I would have to go there, which needless to say though, that's probably where I would choose to go anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause it's a super, super great team, great program, cool place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I heard you're either, I think I read like you're either familiar with that area or like your parents were from there or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My mom actually grew up about 20 minutes South of there. Um, and so every summer since I was a baby, I've been going out there and spending like a month, um, there. So all my family out there is so excited. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like a second home, honestly, or third home. Duke is my second home. (laughs) That's right. Um, and then that, you know, relates really well to kind of our third topic where it's kind of just open discussion, all kinds of random things going on, you know, you're a pre-med major and you said, you know, medical school is like a passion just as much as soccer. So like, what is that conflict of interest? Like, like, you know, maybe is it a go play soccer and go to medical school after, like, I don't think you can do both at the same time, but what are are your Mm -hmm. kind of, and you don't have to tell us the, you know, your full answer, what's your initial kind of, you know, thinking there? Yeah. I wish, I wish I could do both at the same time. Um, but yeah, medicine has always been a passion of mine. Um, and ever since I was young, I've always wanted to be a doctor when I grow up. And that was actually a big reason I came to Duke because uh, there's a really great undergrad pre-med program that I'm kind of in. Um, mm-hmm. And it's been great. But obviously I'm getting to that point where it's tough decisions. Um, and I think where I'm at right now, I'm not anywhere finished with soccer. I still mm-hmm. feel like I'm getting better each year, each day. Mm -hmm. And I think until I don't feel that anymore, I don't want to hang up the cleats. Um, And, you know, who knows when that's going to be. I will say my body gets very, very sore after a workout these days. Um, So we'll see how much longer the body can handle, you know, the demands of a D1 or professional athlete. Um, But the goal at some point is, and I think just growing up being like a female athlete, it's always like you have your aspirations to be professional, but at least I, and most of you, I think have understood that it's not necessarily realistic to set that as my 100% career goal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've kind of like built up two passions, maybe unconsciously, consciously, I don't know, but mm-hmm. always just knowing that, you know, I, I can't necessarily make a living and a full life career from mm-hmm. soccer. Mm-hmm. And so at some point I will have to, you know, put the ball away. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's well, really interesting. I'm going to kind of take a detour here. I hope that's okay with you also, Drew. Um, no, no, so, no. you know, Drew and I have been talking a little bit about, you know, like what there's obviously a, a big gap between men's sports and women's sports. And that's something like we've been trying to dig at and trying to figure out how, how can we improve women's sports? Right. And again, we're going to, this is like a huge topic. We don't have to talk forever about it, but like you said, like 
there's this burden I feel like on women that say that have they have to think like okay there's a chance that I can't make a living from sports while men on the other hand like they can just say hey I'm going to give 110% for sports and I should be fine I think there's a there's a big issue here and the question becomes you know how how can we fix that you don't have to answer that but that's kind of the, it's just, the just a question I want to throw in, out there right yeah no I think it's a it's an interesting topic um and You know, I have always grown up watching male sports um, and only until recently have I watched female sports. So I feel like even a hypocrite myself being like, oh man, like, you know, equality, female sports, when most of my life, I've honestly hardly watched female sports. So Mm -hmm. I think now I try to make more of a conscious effort to, you know, watch the WNBA and then WSL and Mm -hmm. other leagues. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a loaded, a loaded question that I wasn't ready to answer, but hopefully someone has the answer someday. Cause yeah, I think it's improving for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. I think if I'm, I'm going to chip in, I think it's, I don't think I, I personally think it's, it, it's more to the fact that we have to get the them out there and in, in, in the mainstream, you know, like they, they have to be on a platform for people to say, Oh, you know, um, Tess is Tess just got drafted. I'm gonna go watch her. I think it's a conscious effort on everybody to kind of be like, we need to put women's sports in the spotlight, rightfully so. And I think that starts with the smallest thing. Even this podcast, like if this can go viral, that will put a put a map there, and then maybe people will start watching Duke games, and then you know that will go into uh, NWSL and stuff like that. And then once that happens, you know that that is when you get start seeing viewerships, and then you know, like we said, you start drawing a connection with these guys or with these women. Um, personally, growing up, I, I really connected with LeBron James. Um, and I think I, I did that because I saw his, you know, his documentary that came out um, and I had a connection with him. And it wasn't a personal connection, but it was a connection to where I'm like, okay, I'm going to root him on. And then I also think like, that's where I think it needs to start. I think it needs to start in a connection based and getting the women out there and kind of giving them a platform to speak their minds and just to get them out into the mainstream and have people create a connection with them. And then that will draw viewership because obviously the talent is there, you know, there's no denying that. And it's just at the time it's, it's, it's gotta be the viewership. And then that's when the revenue will come in um, and stuff like that. That's, that's my take on things. And I think it all starts with bonding and relationships and connections and, and growing that, cultivating that into a bigger thing. And then that will go up. And then, yeah. So my little spiel on that. If, yeah, well, it's no, uh, no surprise you're at a marketing firm. Cause that's, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, like what, you, what you're doing with us, it's, it helps. Like, I, I feel like, you know, anything to get people out there to bring it in, because obviously Reard and I are going to watch your, your career, you know, develop. And after 20 years of you in the w, WSL, w, NWSL and five championships later, and obviously we're going to be right there holding a championship with you because, you know, you'll invite us <laughs> right. there. But that's another story we'll get into. Um, but that's the thing, like Rhea and I are going to watch your career um, and then our family will watch it. And then, so that's, that's a, it's a rolling ball. And I think the thing with women's sports compared to men's sports is it's just it it has it's so um it's so new right now i think and it hasn't yet hit the mainstream and i i feel like it's coming i really do i feel like the talent is just every single year it's just going 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 up and up and the competition um so that's what i i think is going to happen and i think the future is bright um sadly i'm saying this in a pandemic where all the revenues are down but you just have to get through it one at a time and, you know, just keep on powering through. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah. So to answer your loaded question, Ryota, that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And a loaded answer itself. <laughs> yes. Indeed. I'll just, I'll put a cherry on top to, to end this, this, this discussion in this segment. I think like when, like, I, I can't think off the top of my head of like a women's sports documentary. Like I haven't seen an Abby Wambach or, me a ham or Sue Bird documentary. Maybe that's the next thing. Cause like a lot of people, they really enjoyed the Michael Jordan documentary. Drew, mm-hmm. you were inspired by the LeBron James documentary. So maybe that's the next step. And that, that, that could be a really cool way to inspire. I think, you know, the issue is how can we raise the talent? Cause people are always like, Oh, it's not fun to watch. Well, 
like you either don't watch it or you're not helping yeah. to inspire the competition. And like when you like test, like you're a part of those U15, U17 camps, that's exactly what we need more of, right? Fostering young mm-hmm. talent, fostering inspiration <clears throat> to get the competition higher, which will hopefully lead to more revenue. And then, you know, it just catches up with everything that men's sports has been doing. And it's just, yeah. it just takes time. It's interesting that you both kind of mentioned documentaries um, and I've never even kind of thought about that, but that's such a, a good point because I think like you were saying, you know, me hopping on this podcast with you, I'm like kind of bringing you guys into my journey. And now you guys are way more inclined to follow me because you know my story. Exactly. Um, and I think there's just something to be said about, you know, like when you know someone's story, you want to root for them. You want to know, you know, exactly. more about what's going on there. And I think, yeah, there's definitely, I can't even think of a female one off the top of my head, but I've seen so many of so many male athletes and then mm-hmm. I love them. Um, exactly. And like the all or nothings, I don't know if you guys watch those. Um, it's like a series on where they follow a team for a whole season. And there's like a Michigan mm-hmm. football one, mm-hmm. Tottenham, Man City. And yeah. I love watching those because it like brings you into a team and yeah. I am such a bandwagon, I'll even admit it. But like, it's just so cool. You get to see the inside of a team and then I want to root for them. Yeah. Um, so yeah. No, I anyway, maybe you. your guys' next thing will be getting a documentary going on someone. Yeah, Drew and I will start a GoFundMe to raise like $100,000 to be able to produce one. That's our next step after this. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think okay, you're good. right. I think you're right. I think I think a lot of people when they listen to this will, will connect with you because I mean, when you found out you were drafted, you were doing what I was doing. I, I, I like to, you know, watch Netflix when I'm going to bed. So I feel like that connects with a lot of people on a personal level, even though you're a professional soccer player, I think that connection is still there. Um, so you're right. Knowing somebody's journey will do a lot to go watch them play. And then obviously that, that has a triple effect, but okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, exciting times. Um, let's move on to um, Grey's Anatomy. Okay. So one of my, one of the shows that I'm watching with Danny right now, and I know Tess, you're watching it too. What season are you on so that I won't give away any spoilers and we can dissect this series? Okay. Yeah. Because I will have a massive issue if you spoil some things here, Drew. Okay. Um, I won't do I'm anything. in the, okay, good. I've almost ended friendship over this. I'm kidding. But um, I'm in the middle of season seven. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. This might be harder than I thought. Okay. Um, let's, so what main thing happened? Um, and then from there, we can talk about the past and not the future. Okay. Yeah. Love it. The main thing that happened was uh, Seattle Grace had the shooter. Okay. Um, the, that's yeah. The big so, thing. Okay. That's the big thing. Yeah. So, so okay. Tess, I want to ask you who, what character has been your favorite Um and who are you kind of rooting for? And then I'll give you mine because mine might be an unpopular opinion. Ooh, okay. I'm excited to hear that now. So this is also an unpopular opinion. I'm okay. not a huge fan of McDreamy. Okay. So a, I, what about, what about uh, McSteamy? McSteamy. I love <laughs> Mark. Mark's love. Weird is probably listening to us and be like, what, what is going on? What I'm, I'm looking people up. So I know I'm kind of following <laughs> along here. Uh, no, okay. I love Sloane. Um, not my favorite character, though. My favorite character is probably, oh, actually, Alex Karev. I love Karev. Okay, that's my that was my that was my favorite character, and I thought that would be an unpopular opinion. I just I liked him because be. I liked him because, to be honest with you, when I first saw um, the series, I was like, "When is this guy gonna leave?" But he's been mm-hmm. with it for seven seasons, yeah. so it's like, you know. Um, so I, like I just feel every, like every, every season you get to know, like why he is an asshole and you're like, exactly. Oh, okay. Krev. The growth is there. The growth um, is there. But, and then I also want to do a personal shout out to, um, uh, oh, wait, who am I missing? Um, oh, Torres. I like, yeah. I like Torres a lot. I love her. Um, but okay, so what what do you think? What do you think? What was has been your favorite part 
of Grayson Abbey. And what has kept you, you know, invested in this long standing series? A lot of, a lot of reasons. I'd say one being my pre-med and medical interest, um, which is probably kind of funny because it's not like really the point of the show, but it's always just interesting, I think. Um, and then B, because so many people say they love it. And if so many people say they love it, there's got to be something there. Um, and then what's kept me watching it, I would say, is the character development. I think, like Karev example, like it's just whoever wrote this, which I actually know who wrote it, but I can't think of her name right now. Shonda brilliant. Rimes. Yeah. Shonda Rhimes. Yes. Shonda she Rhimes. Has, she brilliant. has three shows. I think it, it's um, How to Get Away with Murder, Grey's Anatomy, and... Um, Bridgerton, I think. Bridgerton too? She wrote Bridgerton, I'm pretty sure. Three, I don't three. know if that was one of your three. I think, no, it wasn't my three, but I, I also need to check that out. I probably, I, I don't know how that is, but um, it was another one. But I'm just saying, yeah, you're right. She's amazing. Um, and I think the, what has kept me um, on the show is they always do uh, like a sky view of the Space Needle. And I'm and Rio and I are from Seattle. So that has kept me. And I'm just like, oh, the fairies, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And it just, it's funny because, um, I mean, like I, my grandparents lived on Bain or live on Bainbridge and I just love how, like, um, uh, how McDreamy loves the ferry boats. And it's just so funny because it's like, he calls it the ferry when, you know, you want to catch the boat. It's, it, it's just, it's funny lingo that happens. Um, and is he saying it correctly or not incorrectly? Wait, so how does he, he says it, it's been, I mean, he doesn't say it all the time, but doesn't he say yeah. like, he says, I think he, he says the fairies or I think he always pronounces like, the, or I don't yeah, know. Yeah. And then he also puts like the whole, like the fairy boat. Yeah. Which is, is honestly just a fairy and like, or just go catch the boat. I mean, it's, it's so specific, the fairy boat. It's like, okay, we get it. But that's just my little gripe with that. Um, <laughs> gripe. What do you think about Meredith and her whole, I mean, it's obviously about her, so. What, mm -hmm. what do you think about her? And it's just like the, the whole like hooking up with, um, you know, McDreamy and then her, her mother. And it's just like, I feel like her life, I just, it's so tough, her life. It's loaded, yeah. So I have to remind myself sometimes that these are fictional characters and it's, everything's made up because a lot of times I feel so bad for Meredith. And then I'm like, well, this is all fake. Um, <laughs> But no, yeah, I think I go back and forth, though, because sometimes she just kind of pisses me off. Mm -hmm. But then I remember, like, oh, wow, she's really been through it. So she's allowed yeah. to behave that way. You know, yeah. like when she almost lost Derek, because she just couldn't, like, let him love her. I was like, there it is. Yeah, I have a I, I don't really like her. And it's okay. <laughs> I just like I don't like she she's not she, I know she's been through a lot. And it's just like, but the, the things that she also does, is just like, oh my gosh. It's like, <laughs> come on. Just, just yeah. it's not all that dramatic. I mean, but yeah. She does. Um, oh, mm -hmm. What do you think? Okay, so obviously there's medicine involved. From your experience with pre-med, is all of that correct? Or are, there, are they embellishing a lot of it? Because I want to know this. <clears throat> so obviously I'm like, not at all an expert. So okay. I am not equipped to answer this, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Perfect. Um, That's what I I've to hear. been able to be in a couple different ORs um, just from like different internships and stuff. Um, and I will say like from my limited experience, a lot of it is actually pretty spot on. Um, the only thing I think that's over dramatized is how often people almost die in the OR. Like, I don't think that's, like every single time someone's in there, it's like, they're crashing. Like, I don't even know what the words they say half the time are, but um, that, that's what I would say. Who, my, do you, my take. who do you think, since you are the expert out of all three of us, yeah. so you have to do this position, who from the character characters um, is the best doctor probably in real life? Like if you had to take one person in real life to save your life, who are you going to choose? Um, probably either, 
um, Dr. Hunt or Lexi Gray because really? she has the photographic memory. Are you gonna choose? You're gonna choose an intern to save your life? Oh my! You're gosh. right. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing planning Christina. To wait, Christina. <laughs> okay, but right now where I'm at in the show, she's in a dark patch. So, well, I'm remember we're talking I about the past. She you're was right, a the beast. Past, the past. Okay, fine. Beast, how how close are we to her... death in this situation? Wait, what? Good how question. close are we to death in this situation? Um, well, you're lying on the OR bed, and from what you've heard, Riota, the OR bed is basically death from the show. Okay, I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question. I'm picking Nick okay. Dreamy because I want to look at someone hot before I die. <laughs> All right, Riota. That's, that's a good point. That's, I mean, that is true. That's a respectable answer. That is a great answer. Um, okay, <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me propose some more questions then once I think of them. Um, who out of the characters would you want to see leave and doesn't have any substantial things to the plot? Hmm. I get way too emotionally attached, I think, to the characters. That's fair. But I will say when Izzy left, I was like, good riddance. I've had enough of her. Okay, let's talk about this Izzy Izzy line. Because I was like, okay, so at the very start, I was like, oh, I like this character. You know, this character is great. Um, yeah, you know, same. she's very good. And her and George like have this like on and off thing. I didn't know what that was. I was, you know, oblivious yeah. to that. But then she started to see ghosts. And I was like, she needs to leave. Yeah. What did you well, think honestly, about that? The whole, the whole Elvad bitch where she that you was know, bad. cut the Elvad. Yeah. That was, yeah, you know, I don't know. That was a lot. So like falling Rio- in love with the patient. <laughs> Riotta, Izzy, um, who we're talking about, the character we're talking about, um, she cut an Elvad, which, what, what, what did that do again? That It basically killed him. It killed him. So that he could get a transplant. Yeah. It was like, very complicated, but. So that's why I him did him not choose day. Izzy as my, as my doctor um, mm-hmm. when I, because I do not trust her. But I think she, I think you're right. I think Izzy leaving was at the right time. Um, but oh my gosh, it's just like, what about you? Who would you kick off? Well, okay. I can't, well, okay. I can't, I can't talk too much into it, but I think the person that I, I really liked, um, and I was kind of, it was interesting that he left was Preston Burke. Um, I didn't know why Mm -hmm. he left. He just left and I never saw him again. And so I actually uh, read some things on this because I was curious. So long story short, apparently um, George, who I don't know his actual name, the actor's name. He played, George, uh, he played, um, he was part of 41, Ryota, uh, the baseball movie. Okay, continue, sorry. Oh, good, bringing Ryota back in because we're probably just over <laughs> your head with all this right now. Okay. Um, he is gay in real life. And apparently okay. whoever Preston Burke's actor was, was making like homophobic slurs and stuff throughout the show or like off the show. And so George asked to be written off the show. So they wrote George off. And then as punishment, they wrote Burke off. I don't know if this is true. This is all just like fan stuff I've read, but. That just shattered my perception of Burke. Right. Right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that to you. Okay. That's fine. What's impressive about Shonda Rhimes too is like, she could just perfectly weave in like the most heartbreaking tragedies to get people mm-hmm. off the show who don't want to be there anymore. That's true. I mean, the whole George leaving that, wow. that leaving it was, was very, very that sad. Crazy. That was, yeah. that was probably, I actually had to take like a th- two week hiatus because I couldn't handle it. I just got so emotionally uh, attached. Um, yeah. What do you think, what do you think Shonda Rhimes does the best um, in Grey's Anatomy? Is it the medical, um, you know, ability to kind of weave that in? Or is it the character development? Or is it just the drama for you? Mm, probably the character development. Because I feel like I get so, like, going back to the whole, when you know someone's story, you know, you root for them. I feel mm-hmm. like with each character, like, we get to know why they are the way they are. And so when, like, things happen or they're in a situation, we're like, oh my God, like, they're going to do this. They're like, why did they do that? Like, it's going to ruin this, you know? Yeah, that's true. 
So I, you, I have to go with character development. I guess I would have, I guess that was a pretty lame question. I would also have to go with uh, character development. What do you, what has been your b- favorite part of Grey's so far in, in this series of where you're at, taking everything into account? What can you pinpoint me to where you're like, that was a really good episode and kind of tell me why? Hmm. I guess I would say just like Christina and Meredith's friendship is like adorable and powerful. Um, and then I think some of the things that Mark Sloan has said to little gray yeah. would be some of my favorites because it's always like, you're not expecting that from him. You're like, I Oh think, wow. That was like really poetic. I think my favorite part in the whole entire show so far from season, wherever you're at, um, you know, to episode one of season one was when um, when Mark comes in, right? He walks in for the first time to Grace um, to the to the um, hospital, and then um, Derek looks at him and then punches him, and then it's just like there's no backstory to it, and it just happened. And it was like, what what is going on? Who is this guy? Yeah. And like, we obviously find out, <laughs> um, you know, it was warranted, mm-hmm. but still, it, it was that that right there was probably my favorite part um just because it was so out of left field um what do you think so knowing this has been a long time ago do you think meredith whoever plays meredith do you think this is her apex mountain her best role or have you seen her in any other movies to say you know what she was better in this honestly i haven't seen her in like really much else i've seen most of the other characters in other things but I feel like this is just like her show Mm -hmm. so she's gotta stay like she can't get written now what about Derek Shepard McDreamy do you think this is his apex mountain right here do you think this is his best performance and what he's going to be remembered by I feel like yeah just because I I mean he he did kill it and it's just so popular yeah I've seen him in I think I've seen him in two other movies but i think you're right i think this is like the biggest thing let me ask you this now would you rather star in a tv series or star in a hit movie and you have to tell me why in you know in depth okay tv series because i was just gonna say this even if you didn't ask it's funny um i think movies it's so like it's just an hour and a half two hours right and how much, like, how much character development can you do in that little span? Not much. And as mm-hmm. we've already talked about, that's my favorite part. That is true. So that is, you did say that, yeah. I would rather be in, like, a two-year-long TV show where people actually understand me rather than seeing me, you know, just, like, make mistakes in a two-hour movie. And they're like, what the heck? Like, this girl sucks. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, before I give my answer, Rita, what would you rather be in, a movie or a TV series? Um, can you clarify the question? What kind of a, uh, what kind of categories? What kind of you know genre? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, gosh, um, set the scene for us here. All right, you guys are in a medical drama. Okay, we're sticking with the Grays thing. Okay. Okay. Um, and then for your movie, it's going to be a uh, sports. Called rom com. Rom com. It'll be a rom com. So rom-com or medical drama? I think rom-com. A movie. Okay. That was actually tough because rom-coms are great. Okay. Do you want to change your answer? No, no, no. I'm staying with TV series. Okay. I'm choosing, I'm, cho- I'm choosing a movie because one, I don't know if that movie is going to be set in Hawaii or Paris. Um, so boom, I get to already be, um, you know, in a great movie set there. And, um, you know, I only have to work for like two months out of the, out of the year and then I get paid and then I get to watch myself on the big screen. Good point. Um, good so point. I'm choosing a movie, but I guess it really depends on the genre. That's true. What, what are you guys' favorite genre for um, a movie? Rom-com. Okay, rom-com. Ryota? um you know I, I don't have a specific genre i like anything but horror i think this is what i what i answer i think for me i think it has to be horror 
And I'm only saying this because I think right now of where I'm at is I don't think I can watch something that will get me on the edge of my seat like a horror movie. Obviously, it can't be too scary. But I mean, that's the whole point of a horror movie. But still, <laughs> I'm making guidelines of what I like. Um, and I think, I mean, I've seen the whole, um, uh, who, who did Us and It? Or Us and um, the other horror movie. Um, I, just, I think that is what I like kind of strive for and like, okay, that is going to get me scared. I'm going to be on the edge of my seat um, kind of thing. But to finish off on the favorite TV show, Grey's Anatomy in particular, um, Tess, what do you think will happen right now at where you're at? Any bold predictions? Bold predictions? Um, worried about Christina. So, okay. you know, I have a feeling she's going to be leaving the show soon, but we'll see. I hope not. I realized when I asked that question, I felt like I could have gave something away. So that is why I'm not going to give anything away. So <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Um, I Christina has been my favorite character too. And I think she is, she's definitely a character that I think has also kind of like been developing, but I feel like she's just so badass in the sense that she kicks, like she knows everything that she should already be like a, an attendee and stuff like that for me. I just feel Agreed. like she's just so powerful in that sense. She um, is. But now that, now that you shattered my kind of, you know, glass that I was looking into for Preston Burke, I feel like she hasn't really like the, her relationship with Preston Burke, I thought was like meant to be, but now, now I can see why, you know, maybe okay. it's Hunt or she something. Has do you like, do you like how the relationships are forming or not? I love Hunt and Christina. Okay. I do too. Yeah. Just to throw that and out And I there. love Teddy. Oh, you do? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think she's a bit annoying, but that's, that's, that's just me. Okay. I, You're a season ahead, so maybe I'll start to think she's annoying soon. Yeah, we'll see. Tess, thank you for joining us. Um, we wish you the best for your Duke season coming up, as well as, you know, congrats again for being drafted. Um, we would love to have you on again, um, you know, in the season or out of the season, um, just like an update on your career to keep connected, um, as well as we def or I definitely want you on after we finish Grays together, and then we can you know dissect that whole thing. Um, but thank you for coming on, we appreciate it, and best of luck. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryota and Drew. Um, can't wait to see any more people you get on this podcast coming up. Appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Tess. Cool. Have a good one.